Welcome. I'm Matthew Young. I am uh, managing editor at Oaknoll Press of Oaknoll Books and Press, and um, we are starting a series of uh, interviews with authors, printers, binders, um, book arts people, uh, collectors, uh, scholars, who knows? We're, we'll see where it goes. But uh, this is the first um, attempt, and we will I will be interviewing uh, Frank Romano, author of History of Desktop Publishing, um, which which we published last year in both uh, hardback and paperback. And uh, because I'm stuck at home, I do not have a copy of the book with me, but I will show you the page from our catalog to get started. Um, there's Frank out in the corner. Uh, here's the cover of the book. Uh, a picture of the Font Wars um, meeting that uh, we will, I will mention. Uh, and there is the cover of the book, um, which to me looks mirror image, but I think it looks correct to you. So let's get started. Thanks. Well, um, I, I was going to start with the, is it Seabold or Sabold? Seabold. Seabold. I was going to start with the Seabolds. Um, John, the father, uh, is, is sort of the father of computer typesetting, right? He wrote most of the books. He did most of the lectures. And yeah. then in the 70s, he started the newsletter that documented it all. Right. The Seabold Report and, and then the Seabold Seminars. That is correct. And yeah. then Jonathan carried it forward. Right. Um, that that's that's a pretty amazing legacy th those two uh, and, and they've they've you know they've followed it and reported on it and influenced it um from the very beginning uh, bill gates would never do a se do any seminar presentation unless it was with jonathan siebold really yeah he's the only one he trusted yeah um and and you dedicated uh, you dedicated or a dedication in the book is to him uh, you said he saw the future and brought the major players together to make it happen. And, and well, that's absolutely true because he, yeah. all the companies told Jonathan what they were doing on the right. non-disclosure. So he knew what Apple was doing, what Adobe was doing, uh, what Aldous was doing. And he realized that they all had something in common. So right. he said to them, well, you have to talk to one another. Right. So they got together and then realized they had something which later became desktop publishing. Yes, even though they were competing, you know, bitter enemies in 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 terms of trying to get the, you know, get get a foot forward ahead of the other. Um, well, not really, because um, Apple had actually put fourteen million dollars into Adobe to have exclusivity for a while on PostScript. Right. Uh, all this didn't quite know where all this was trying to create a typesetting page makeup system. Yeah. And John, and, and it was going to be in a PC. And it was Jonathan who said to him that you really should consider the Mac. So they really weren't competitive. What they were doing was independent, but when they came together, it created a real system. Yeah. And, and Warnock was really, uh, he was really look, looking forward to, to uh, cross-platform stuff um, bef long before, you know, for everybody else, it was a dream in the future. Well, that, that was another thing. Um, Warnock and Geschke originally, their business plan was to create a giant typesetting system. And yeah. PostScript was just the output module. Right. And, um, and so they, as they went around and started talking to people, and especially to Apple, Apple said, we don't care about the rest of the stuff. We just want that PostScript part. Yeah. And that, then they changed their business plan. And then when all this came along, they realized it could be part of something better. And that got them more into type. And they became yeah. the leader in the type area for a long time. Yeah, and and the the type the t whole type story is fascinating. In your, oh yes, yes, the, we used to call um, it the font wars. The font wars, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I was when I, back in the eighties, I was in uh, advertising design for a small company, and we, you know, we got these little box Macs. I, I guess they were probably. 128 or 256 K and started working with them. And, uh, you know, nothing was ever the same. <laughs> oh no. I, 
Bye bye. Well, here's the museum. We have the first four Macs that were ever made. Um, and then um, Steve sent me something no one else has. I have a next machine. Oh, you do? Yeah. Wow. Well, we, we should do a tour of the museum sometime. Yes, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, I mean, no one's come here for the last uh, eight weeks. Is that where you are now? Yeah. In the museum? Yeah, I spend most of my time here. This is where I work and do everything. I'm uh -huh. setting up new exhibits. And now uh, here in Massachusetts, we have this phase program. Right. So by the beginning of June, I'll be able to open up with stringent requirements. Yeah. And and are you sort of you, you sort of set up for that so you have a, a route around the museum that people can follow and I'm gonna put down steps and all that and follow and yeah. I have to put up posters and I've bought extra masks. I've I've bought you have to have everybody have masks. And, yeah. yeah. So I'm being very careful about the whole thing. Right. Hopefully you won't get any protesters. By the way, you can't have more than ten people. Well, we've never had more than ten people here anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So you're all set up for it anyway. That's right. Um uh, the desktop publishing programs. I, I'm trying to remember if I if I ever used PageMaker. I must have uh, early on. It was not a very good program, but it was well, the, first one. the yeah. one that made it was Quark Express. Right, and that's what I that's what I latched onto and used for years and years and years until their till their uh, you know till their new their their new versions became too expensive and too kind of. Um, prohibited, they, they were not compatible with older files, and there were some problems with that. And I still they, use uh, Quark, by the way. What? I still use Quark. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and, no. so, and, and, and so do a bunch of other designers I know uh, prefer Quark just because they, you know, it's familiar to them. Um, but well, you know, but then, but then when, they, when, they, when they send files to, well, now they send PDFs to printers, so it doesn't yeah, matter, yeah. but, uh, you know, but when they when they have to be compatible with other people they have to switch to to uh, indesign now no doubt about it i wrote the book in quark and mindy had to convert it all over into indesign oh really yes right i know that yeah that that was interesting um, uh, by and, the way i wrote the first book on quark and the first book on indesign did you write the first in book fact, on warnock wrote the introduction to my book on indesign it was the only book he ever wrote an introduction for Oh, well, I got to get that. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, but it goes back to InDesign 1. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, so uh, so I, I consider Quark to be a more efficient program. However, Quark was a very hard company to deal with. Well, that's that's sort of what, what we found out, you know, when you, when you bought the product and then had to upgrade. Um, it was very difficult to talk to them, and, and they were very strict about, you know, about it was expensive. And you you had to convert all your old files into some, I don't know, I can't remember how now, how, what, all the hoops we had to jump through. I reprinted the article that appeared in, in um, Forbes magazine, in the yeah. book, where Fred Abrahimi, one of the owners of Quark, was quoted as saying that all of his customers were liars, thieves, and bastards. <laughs> and the reason Forbes ran that is that Forbes was using Quark and didn't like dealing with it. And so they wrote this scathing article about them. Well, yeah. <laughs> they knew how to get even. Get back at them, sure. Well, I sort of felt like that sometimes <laughs> too. Anyway, I've gotten used to InDesign and that's what we use now. Yeah, that's fine. I yeah. have InDesign as well, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so uh, tell me a little more about Warnock and, and uh, I, you know, I, I feel like, I feel as though without Adobe, there, there would still be this, this wide gap between operating systems. Um, and, and he really, he really saw, that, saw that and put it together and was working with everybody uh, after, well, after their proprietary thing with Apple. I got to know them pretty well. Yeah. Um, the, first of all, PostScript is not an operating system. It's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, actually a program. What, you can what, actually write an accounting program with PostScript. Yeah. I used yeah. to teach it, by the way. And, uh, and I taught students how to get in there and understand it. So I said, you know, someday in the middle of the night, you're gonna be working for a company and there's a problem, the file won't run, you, you, and you need to get into the code and understand what the problem is and fix it. And they all complained and moaned and groaned. And then years later, I would get an email from them saying, you know, one night I had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and they were and they was able to solve it. They remembered how to do it, or they had the notes. Yeah. So, 
So the thing that made, because there were other page description languages out there at the time. Right. The thing that made PostScript unique was it dealt with typography as a special area. Right. No one else was doing that. It was the type part of it that made it unique. Yes. And that's what Steve Jobs latched onto because he has a laser printer coming out and it's only 300 DPI. How does he make the type look good? And so, again, I worked with Steve and with, with, with uh, Warnock and Geske when it was all coming together. And Warnock and Geske got the, the idea for all this when they were still at um, Xerox yeah. because they wrote the modules for the new Xerox printer. And so the problem there was that all the fonts were fixed bitmap fonts. Well, I know you have that page where that page where you make the letter, the sort of small letter E out of various sized dots and, you know, and showing that how you, what you had, what they were starting with. And Absolutely right. Uh, and they wanted to do one that had the ability to enlarge and, and reduce the size of the type. And Xerox said, nah, work on something else. Yeah. And so when they left uh, Xerox with this business plan to build this big system, that, that was the very important part of it for the output side. Because at that time, all the output devices were changing. They were all becoming laser-based, and right. therefore they had the ability to drive any raster-based unit. Right. Laser-based rather than what, dot matrix? That is, well, again, we oh. use our photo typesetting machines used um, negative uh, film, glass, and plastic, and they force light through it. Right. When you get to the dot matrix printer, which was a very coarse set of dots, yeah. then you get to the laser printers, which were very fine series of dots. Right. And once that happened, it opened up computer to plate, it opened up digital printing, and the whole world. And, then, and PostScript was right there at the right time. Yeah. Now, I remember... Um, back when I edited a, a small local newspaper, we, we had a CompuGraphic machine. And I worked for CompuGraphic. What? I worked for CompuGraphic. Oh, did, you, did you? Now that was a pretty good machine. What color was it? What color was the machine? Yeah. Tan. So you had a very early one. You had a 2961 or a 4961. Yes, right. This was, this was back in the 70s. Um, yeah, I was their first marketing communications manager. Were you? Okay. And uh, I had a ball there because I had no the, I had no employees and nobody worked for me. So I, I, got, I was in charge of all the packaging, public relations, advertising, trade shows. Yeah. It was a small company then. And then it blossomed, if you can believe it. And right. the only reason I left was I hit 30 years old. And I said, if I didn't go off on my own at 30, I would never do it. <laughs> they offered me all kinds of stock incentives and everything to stay, and I said, "No, I've got to be my own boss." Yeah, that's that's about when I when I did that too. Went out on my own and became a freelance designer. Um, uh, what, what what I was uh, another thing I was thinking about reading this book is is you know if if a young person were reading this, somebody was born twenty years ago or something, it's it's a little like, like you, you know, well, when we went to school, we went barefoot and we had to go walk two miles. And <laughs> Uphill they, both ways. They, they, grew, they grew up, uh, you know, they grew up with all of this from the very beginning. It, it's hard for me to imagine that. It must be just as hard for them to imagine, you know, what it was like in the, in the 60s and 70s. Well, when I try to, you know, teach history to students, their eyes glaze over. Do, do so they I've got to dress it up, and, yeah. and I've got to bring in personalities and talk about conflicts. Yeah. It has to be a story, yeah. because the, the history of it is relatively dull. Well, yeah, because it's so technical and yeah, and all of that. No, it's 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 those it's the pictures of uh, oh, I, I think it was the Font Wars picture yeah. of uh, of Warnock and Jobs and and Gates at the same table. Oh, that is a classic picture, by the way. That, uh, by the way, that's my picture. There was a photographer right there who took exactly the same picture. Yeah. We got it at the same. And the reason it's so bad is I did it with an Instamatic. Uh-huh. And so I had, it was color and I had to convert it. Uh, so I wish it was better quality. So but that's you so small on the page. That's right. And so you can see the body language of Warnock there. It's unbelievable. Right. I was the, by the way, I moderated the panel right after that one. You what? 
I moderated the panel oh, right did you? after that. Yeah. yeah, so when they came down, I went up there and um, <clears throat> I, uh, I was then moderating a different panel that involved IBM and Xerox. Yeah. Oh, well, that was a very hist historic site. Let me tell you, when that happened, the entire audience was on the edge of their seats. Yeah. Um, one thing that that uh, you know that I was unsure about in this book when when we were considering it for publication was was all the lists of uh, you know, know. the lists of all the companies, the lists of all the articles in Type World, but you know, but I, I who which reviewers uh, Hamilton or 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 uh, who was the other one? Warden um, reviewed it for. Uh, it said said that you know. Oh, well, no, what? Walden. Walden, yes. Said, said you know, nowhere else uh, can you find this information, um, much less in one place. You, you know, there's just... Oh, he comes to the museum a lot because, in fact, Jonathan was here because I have a complete set of all the newsletters. Yeah. Very few people have a complete set. Right. I saved them all. Wow. And, uh, so Jonathan was writing uh, the, uh, the uh, computer museum in California was doing a a, a, a series on the history of desktop publishing. Yeah. So Jonathan, in order to write the series, needed access to his own material. Yeah. And and that's where it was. That's right. I Nobody, save everything. Nobody else had a complete set. Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> RIT has a complete set, but you can't get at it. Yeah. Right. It's in storage somewhere. That is. That's the problem. At, at the, uh, again, I was paid at the same budget at RIT that the carry collection is. Yeah. The problem is they don't have a lot of space, so a lot of it is in a, in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. As is as is so much material in libraries. Yeah. Fortunately, really here I've made a lot accessible, but now as we're getting more and more, it's getting harder to do that, and I understand the problem. So, I, I'd like to get a few million dollars to build an addition on the building for storage. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can sell a few copies for you. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, when did you begin Type World? I, I'm trying to remember from the... 78, uh, January of 78. Okay, and, and what started you on that path? Um, I had, um, when I left CompuGraphic, I started a whole batch of newsletters. Yeah. Um, there were very, there were some typesetting machines that were coming out that became very popular, like Linotype had one called the VIP. Variable Input Photo Typesetter. Uh -huh. And a lot of people were buying it. And I thought, you know, they would like information specifically about their machine. So I started a newsletter called Vippy, V-I-P-P-Y, because okay. that was sort of the nickname I gave to it. Right. And um, that, that got up to a few thousand uh, circulation. And then I discovered I could sell things through it, gadgets and gizmos. I could run conferences and seminars. So then I started one for the CompuGraphic machine, the CompSet. Uh, the um, the um, edit writer called the Eddie. I called it Eddie, E D D Y. And right. then I started one for Veritiper. They had one, and I called that one Compi. <laughs> Keeping in the same spirit. Yeah. Okay. So then, one I'm te teaching at night at Northeastern University. I'm sitting there one day, and I'm thinking, you know, I could combine all these and create a publication. And Computer World had just come out. And I said, well, I'll call mine Type World. Okay. And so I combined all the circulations. I had just enough money to do one issue. And it was profitable. In fact, one of my first advertisers was the Siebel's. Wow, yeah. They, they bought an ad in it. And uh, that, 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 was, that was nice of them. I mean, I think that was- Again, it was, it was like was a big in the industry. You know, we all respected one another. Yeah. And we weren't competitive as such. Um, and I only printed press releases. I didn't do any in-depth articles or anything like that. Right. Um, but I came out twice a, twice, a, twice a month. So you saw the information more frequently because the other magazines were monthly and it took a long time for them to get, get anything into print. Yeah. Because I printed on news, I could do it a lot faster. And so it, it got me into trade shows, it got me into marketing, it got me into seminars, into all that stuff. And so we never had an unprofitable issue. Yeah, I think, and I think it said you had a circulation of about 14,000 or something. We started with 14,000. That was the, of all the newsletters, that's what I had, 14,000 names. That was the combined. And then by the time it ended, when I sold it, it was just over 100,000. Wow. And my partner, Sam Blum, um, 
the, the problem I had was at that time, I made my reputation by saying nasty things about vendors. Okay. I, I, I needed to separate myself from other consultants by being very blunt and funny and all that. And so I, my problem was no one was gonna buy advertising from me. So my friend Sam Blum was out of work. I said, how would you like to be the publisher? Yeah. And so, so he said, let's give it a shot. And so it was, it was a great relationship. And because uh, I had worked with Sam when I was at the old Mergenthaler company years before. And uh, Sam is Jewish. And so he had a thing that said, um, OPEC countries, $100 surcharge. And they paid it. <laughs> Without question. <laughs> so so it, it was great. And, and, and then when I sold, I didn't want to sell it, but uh, Penwell Publishing kept coming after me because it was a natural relation. They had a good relationship with another magazine they owned called Computer Graphics World. Yeah. And they, they were able then to, to co-sell them. So that's the only reason I sold it. Now you said you said in the book that InDesign actually falls a little bit after your after the span of your book. Yeah, it came well, out later than I. Again, I didn't want to cover things today. Right. Um, and so InDesign was sort of at the tail end of the desktop publishing era, if you will. Right. So so you took it up to the point of InDesign. Yes. And, and some other developments. Um, Otherwise, I would have had to get into web stuff, and I. That's another book, and that's not for me. Right. That's that's another age. So don't forget now. I've done three books: the history yeah. of the line and type company. Yeah. Everything hot metal. The yep. history of photo typesetting era. Everything photo typesetting and desktop publishing. That's my life in the industry. Right, and you did them all with different publishers, which was yes. which was quite interesting. Yes. And by <laughs> the way, I don't make any money on any of them. Oh no, I know. It's, uh, on, on on the RIT one, all the money goes to a scholarship fund. Does it? Good. Same at Cal Poly. Yeah. And the money from this book goes uh, to the museum. Yep. Yeah. yeah. What I tried to do is document, create a time capsule for what it was like to be in that world at that time. That's a so good that's word. There's so much stuff in it. And you can read it with all the detail if you want, or you can just read the sort of narrative stuff I've done. Right. It's like a magazine article and an academic article. Right, and you can you can hop around and take each chapter separately. You don't have to. It's not. That's why there's so many chapters. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not. It doesn't necessarily follow from one to the other. It does in no, some respects. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to uh, to work with you on that, and uh, and I think it turned out very well. And we do. And I just put I just put a few of those reviews up online. Uh, where, where did Siebel's uh, review uh, that he's quoted? Uh, that he, uh, there, there's a quote of, of him about the book, but I don't know where it appeared. Do you? I have no idea. The only one I sent it to you. I never used it anywhere. Yeah, somebody. Uh, um, it's it must be something. It, it said that he, that he wrote it, so it must have been in just he an. He must email. have sent it to someone on his own. Yeah. Yeah, sent it to someone on his own. But it's a nice quote, so I put that up there too. Yeah, Jonathan made his money when he he sold out the the newsletter and the show. The show made more money. Yeah. Um, to um, to multiple companies over the years. Uh, I made more money than him selling the magazine and the trade shows. But then he invested his money in a company called Pretty Good Privacy, which had a security system. And when they went public, that's when he made the big bucks. Okay. And you're still in touch with, with all these people who are... Oh, yeah, we still keep in touch. Uh, again, because the museum has so much technology, we're the only collection of photo typesetting machines in the world. Yeah. Plus, I have all the books and materials and ephemera from that era. Um, yeah. uh, they're always asking me questions about things. Oh, yeah. Ask Frank. That's right. <laughs> when I go, that's the end of it. <laughs> well, at some, at, at some point, I'm going to get up there to that museum. I, I keep meaning to do it. And, you know, one thing or another... Uh, gets in the way, or, if or like again. And now, now we're in the in the middle of this. So, um, but when we can, I will. Where do you live? In Hopewell, New Jersey. Oh, okay, You're not too yeah, far. Near, yeah, near near Princeton, and um, uh, you know, I I was driving down to uh, Delaware once a week for meetings. Um, now we do meetings by phone, uh, which is you know, not not too much different, but but I. You know, I miss getting together with them in a room. Uh, 
So. Well, I only visited there once because every now and then I go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's yeah. a big letterpress group called the Point Nine One Eight Club. Okay. And, and they drive me around everywhere. And I said, can we go to Oak now? Yeah. And so that's the only reason I got to visit Oak now. Oh, well, come down sometime. <laughs> when, it's, when this all clears up, I'll come your way, you come our way. That uh, would be great. OK. 